Continuing some of complexity being a buffer, I was talking primarily last time we were taping about its relationship to the individual, but do take note specifically, and in a larger sense, that life itself continually makes use of complexity as a buffer. It has backup systems everywhere. This is not normally noted in the cases where it might be noted in some way. It's of no expansive consequence. But life has arranged itself in such a way. All you got to do is hear a piece of this and then look around. It engages continually, continually unrecognized and overkill. It has so many backup systems that what can appear from certain quite reasonable three-dimensional intellectual views to be near catastrophes or in, or in local conditions can be calamities. Does it stop life? Does, retrospectively speaking, men, intelligent, educated men, now looking back and being somewhat concerned over the fact that so many, thousands, so many, simpler forms of life have now simply vanished, and what this may portend, does that affect life? No matter what seems to be the purpose of life, that if we're talking about intellectual men dealing with backward history, that they're apparently looking back over the last few months, last few years, their lifetime, and pointing out from their view, not some insane, radical, off-center view, but perhaps a fairly widely held view, that over this period of time, let's say the last 20 years since this person's been alive, in ways in which he can describe things are going downhill. He can give you specific examples. The crime rate here is up. Building permits are down. Savings are down. Unemployment is up. You know, give me a break. I don't hear more. It's obvious that locally, right, things are moving downhill. Evolution is not in charge. We're talking about devolution and not the group from Akron, Ohio. What if we said for some local temporary discussion that, well, there's no doubt, given the facts as you have presented them, then you are correct, life is at some sort of standstill if it's not going into reverse. But then look, does that have any sort of lasting effect? And by now, I'll assume that you people, if you're not good enough to look on your own, at least when I try to trick you or say you are, you go, yeah, I am, and you pretend you are. That is, to recognize, you, there's nowhere to look. You don't have to really look in history books if you need confirmation of it from the apparent out there and you know how to read, you can go back and look, but you should be able now to feel it within your own genetic system that life is not going downhill. Life is getting more complex. Life is getting more alive. Life is getting more intelligent. Life is getting better. Life is getting easier to live. Life is getting healthier at our level. So if that be the case, then if you look at the local conditions, and back to my example, if we gave it credence, if we gave absolute validity to the man's statement and his examples that locally things are falling apart and we say, all right, you're right. Under the scenario that you have described, you are correct. Now we're left with that great, or one of the great, I submit to you, unrecognized laws of physics, that is, so what? Has it affected life negatively? Or as the philosophers and physicists, I guess, in California would say, has this temporary, isolated, inverted growth had a negative impact on the overall health of the avocado dip? <laughs> no. You know why? Among other reasons I can describe or suggest to you, life is so complex that if, and I'm still just saying if, that we agreed that under certain local conditions that can be described by someone, that yes, right here, life is in reverse, and it may suffer serious tire damage. <laughs> Things are going downhill right here. But then you're left with this immediately. So what? Yeah. And even if you cannot see it, what I'm suggesting to you, when I told you it's unrecognized, is that life is so complex 
there are so many backup systems that are not recognized as backup systems. I mean, just because the man says, back to my example that we're going to accept, prima facie, the guy says, Un unemployment is up, building permits are down. Let us say that this one example, he is saying that locally, economically, we are approaching disaster time. All right, I am not going to try and describe to you if it could be done. I'm not even saying it can be done, but I'm not going to tell you that there is a description for me to say, all right. Now, everything he described, let us say that the statistics are in his favor. He knows what he's talking about. But there is a backup system. Life is not about to collapse, economically or any other way. Not life, not humanity. But is there a describable backup system? No. If there is, I'm not going to fool with it. But let me just tell you there's not, in case you want to think about it a second. Does that mean there's not one? I guess so if you're a very limited intelligence, that is, a reasonable, logical person, I guess. But how do you explain the fact that life presses on and keeps getting better and better, although from your view, and you may be surrounded by a whole bunch of people that you're all looking and going in one area, let's say economically right here, that things are in a terrible mess and they're getting worse. And you and many people are looking through the same hole saying, yes. But do things get worse? Maybe for you. Maybe for the people standing next to you. But do things ever get worse for life? And one of the ways to consider it in a useful manner on your own is that complexity is its own protection. And that life has unrecognized, even as I'm suggesting to you, unidentifiable <laughs> verbally unidentifiable backup systems because I'm not going to try and tell you what is the backup system for a local collapse economically. I'm just going to, let, let me just say, well, there is no easily describable, or there is no describable backup system that would appear to be the specific backup system for economic decay, <laughs> which is what you'd expect, that if I'm saying there is a backup system everywhere and you go, okay. And then I make up an example that things are collapsing locally in an economic manner. And you go, okay. And I say, there's a backup system. And you say, well, all right, could I, you know, would you just give me an idea of what it is? You would assume there's got to be something related to, oh, what, economics? Yeah, probably. And I just told you there is none. Does that mean there's not a system? Well, of course, at the ordinary level, you would assume that if your car has a flat tire, that the uh, cure for it is to patch the tire, right? That's pretty obvious. That's pretty primitive. So to assume that the backup system for economic problems is in some way economic is very simplistic. And if that's as far as you can go, then I could go ahead and predict for you that you'll never be able to see the backup system. Because if you're looking for a backup system, that has to be, we should be ashamed for me to even say it, that the backup system has to be in some way related to that which needs to be backed up. <laughs> that if I'm telling you there's backup systems to such things as economic problems or any other kind of problems, and it just seems, well, just reasonable that if there is such a backup system, it's got to be in some way, some way connected to economics. <laughs> now, as Ezekiel said, oh, ye of little, what do you say, feet? No. <laughs> Well, uh, he said something. I can't remember now. Life is so complex. Uh, rather than leave that at just what appeared to be a joke, when I say that the backup system is not necessarily describable and is not necessarily anywhere that the ordinary intelligence would ever look, no matter how intelligent you are at the ordinary level, because you would expect that the backup system for some specific problem in some way would be related to the problem. I didn't get much of a response off my flat tire try it another way. If you had a flat tire and I said there's a backup system and we'll all assume that having an automobile that runs, and most automobiles require four fairly healthy tires and if we said the problem is a flat tire and I said life provides a backup system because it needs people with automobiles 
And you'd say, all right, the backup system would be what, if you couldn't guess? And then you would expect me to say something like, a service station that repairs tires. You go, yeah, that's true. That life did not just suddenly take all those humans that it needed doing whatever humans needed to be doing to have automobiles, and it gives life has provided you a car and four tires. And then one day you finally have a flat tire, and life just leaves you there. No, life has a backup system. It needs you to continue getting around, so life has provided a backup system. In this case, people who repair tires, or people that even sell new ones. It is not that simple. I hesitate continuing to say such as that because it's not only not that simple, it's not only not that complex. <laughs> it's beyond the realm of anything that you would expect. It's beyond the realm of what can easily be described, not because it's some kind of great secret, not because you're too dumb to see it, but cannot you just see that life is so rich, life is so complex, that something over here that three-dimensional intelligence simply having a partial view of something greater, such as 5D and, uh, reality, sees this problem, a flat tire economic collapse. And it expects that if there is a backup system, it in some ways got to be related to this. And it does not. It is simply that life is so complex that over here, apparently something can start falling apart, and so what? But it's only ordinary intelligence will say, what do you mean, so what? If there is not some specific backup system for this problem, you know, this is a real problem. This is something that must be looked at. Well, if too many of you are missing this, I always hate to do this because it is really tricky. No, I shouldn't say I hate to do it with you people. Should I? Who cares? That is, if, if you're so dumb still to fall for the little tricky vicinity of this, then you shouldn't be hanging around here anyway, right? Right. That is... The backup system, if nothing else, is always that appear that what appears to be the effect of some cause. That is, I can say that life is not destroying itself. Humanity is not destroying itself. Humanity is not destroying life. Humanity specifically is not destroying this planet. So therefore, the idea is that uh, man is going to destroy, say, the equatorial rainforest to such an extent that it's going to upset the balance of the atmosphere and the... Uh, and I can say that's not going to happen. And then ordinary intelligence can say, wait a minute, we've got statistics to show that the rate it's going now, we're losing where it is. 10,000 acres of rainforest every 45 minutes. And at the rate we're going, within 10 years, within 10 years, none of us will be able to breathe. <laughs> All right, let's say the statistics show that. So what? Do you think that's going to happen? If you do, you might as well be a priest or something or going to aluminum siding sales. Something... <laughs> Something where a negative attitude counts for something, by God. But not, but not in trying to think anew. It counts for nothing. Because what I was getting at, this tricky one again, let's assume all that's true. And let's assume that I am absolutely correct. It's not even a prediction. There's no word for it. I'm just stating a fact. We're not going to destroy the planet. And let's assume that life is making these Cassandras they were talking about the destruction of the rainforest and its subsequent calamitous effect. Let's assume that they're correct statistically. They're correct in their 3D view. All right. Within 10 years, before this comes to pass, if their statistical predictions are correct, before it comes to pass, there'll be a whole bunch of Cassandras. And then they'll become active Cassandras, not just hollering out dire predictions. Humanity will stop what they seem to be doing now. And I can say, from one view, all right, there's a backup system. Now, ordinary intelligence, when I said always is tricky when mistakes, it takes as it should. The seriatim run of what seems to be cause and effect, and ordinary intelligence would say to me in response, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Humanity didn't actually do anything. Humanity finally, thankfully, recognized this problem and humanity, because of this pressing problem that we're about to destroy ourselves, finally, I'm, I'm amazed, but finally enough people in positions of authority took some action. That's the only thing that saved us. The damn calamity was breathing down our neck. We were then months of destroying ourselves. Right. But you understand, I'm not just being sarcastic. There is no response to that. That is the prevailing atmosphere of intellectual activity at the ordinary level. 
They're correct. I mean, they don't have to know anymore. But it's not that. It's not that the calamity made humanity do something because humanity didn't cause the calamity, the impending, the imagined calamity, the predicted calamity. But then the backup system is so nebulous, it is so far removed from ordinary intelligence, so far removed from any kind of wired up expectation that you can't see it's a backup system. It looks like if you're ordinary that, well, something happened here in this calamitous predictions. The increasing unemployment the increasing destruction of the rainforest finally was just right up on us. This destruction and enough people with some intelligence, enough people with some authority and political, if not economic wherewithal, began to make new moves and saved us. Complexity saved you. Life has enough backup systems. Life is complex enough that it can handle any transient anomaly. It can, any kind of temporary breakdown, blowout, flat tire, car overheated on the side of the road instead of car to read humanity. <laughs> it has enough backup systems. It is complex enough in ways, which I was trying to do here for the first 15 minutes, which enough of you I think has gotten, I'm going to press on. It is complex enough in ways that you never imagined. Not because you can't imagine, it's just that they do not fit into the three-dimensional logical scheme. It's just life is so complex that something can apparently undergo transient problems, even breakdowns over here, but life is so complex that it doesn't matter. And don't worry about, well, wait a minute, I can't see anything complex enough that is actually trying to take up the slack specifically over here. Right. You're right, you can't see it. And it may not be there in such a way to ever be able to be described three-dimensionally, but simply look at a greater, more complex picture. Life is complex enough that over here, something terrible apparently is either about to happen or may happen. A great depression in one part of life's body. A catastrophe, tidal waves, typhoons, plagues that locally plague several times. Some of you may have read in the paper if you were alive back during the Middle Ages that several times hit northern, northern and western Europe and wiped out by some accounts like 50% of the population. Which, when you hear that, if 50% of the population of this country were wiped out in a period of a few months and somebody said, I consider this a calamity. i got to tell you the truth. I, w I would not disagree with it. I'd say, well, that's pretty bad news, especially if half of you was part of the 50% going. <laughs> But notice, notice that all those things happen. What happened to life? Life is still whistling and picking its teeth and getting fatter, getting more intelligent because it is complex enough. Now you can start if you want to follow that right quick and say, well, all right, large segments of a population in one area can be decimated by something, but then life is producing in other areas that are not undergoing some kind of calamity. So many people it makes up for it. Okay, so you're getting a little bit better. But I'm telling you, it's more than that. That they could be undergoing a health crisis such as a plague somewhere, and in some part of life's other body, a more complex system that may be counteracting that could be economic. Don't try and figure it out. Or I'll put it to you another way. Over here in one area that they may be about to undergo an economic or are undergoing an economic calamity, it may be the burgeoning birth rate in some other area taking up for that. Yeah, but that doesn't make any sense. Don't think about it. <laughs> it is simply so complex. Life has enough backup systems that any kind of anomaly, setback, breakdown, anything that happens, and of course hum humans always take it personally. They think they're doing it. Or they think they made the gods mad they used to and the gods are doing it. But at least humans now take it, mostly in the intellectual part of life's world, they take it person that we're doing it. You can look at it any way you want to from a three-dimensional view and you'll never be able to see. That's why I, apparently everyone could write a doomsday column every day. But you cannot see past the local level. You take it personally, but past the local level, there are no calamities. Life is so complex that any calamity... Over here may be like a terrorist bomb blows up a whole country. And to life is like passing gas. You know, <clears throat> you know, one burp and it's over with. Because that's not going to kill life. Does it kill you? Does one pimple run your social life forever? 
God, I hope not. <laughs> the potential for a greater complexity at the individual, of course, is there, or it would not be there in life. It's always what seems to be a personal significance of some external springboard I use of economics or politics or myth or religion or whatever, music, baseball. As always, the personal potential version, in this case of complexity, is an absolute variation or version of what seems to be the greater out there and everywhere phenomenon. That life is that complex. Now at a certain mechanical level, humans, I could say just ordinarily, are complex enough that they can survive. Such as, again one of the examples, it's something that if beforehand, if it was talked about, you might consider individual, if you're an ordinary person, that if I said, right, your husband or your wife or your little child is going to die tomorrow. And it would strike you that I, I don't think I could survive that. I really don't. That would be, I just don't think I could. Chances are, if it happened, you would survive it, right? Now, you might go into great emotional depression and et cetera. But generally, people survive it. At that ordinary level, it is not dissimilar to what I'm describing, that life can undergo plagues, depressions, natural, so-called natural catastrophes, and at some local level, Pompeii gets wiped out. No doubt about it. But Italy survived. Or if Vesuvius had even been more full of gas, let's say it could have wiped out Italy. But I'll tell you what, the Mediterranean area would have survived, and if it wiped out the Mediterranean area, Europe would have survived, all right? On that mechanical level, things that would apparently be just absolutely calamitous, and that people might even say beforehand that I could not survive this, just as Europe might say, I cannot survive losing 50% of my population. You might say individually that if this is possible, that my youngest child, my only baby is going to die I couldn't survive it. Chances are you will, to put it mildly. Chances are you will. So mechanically, people are complex enough. In this way, that example, it would appear to be from ordinary descriptions, it would appear to be that they are emotionally complex enough that things, terrible things, calamities can happen to people, and yet, as they say, you can almost a few days later, a few weeks later, kind of brush yourself off and finally comb your hair and take a shower and get back out there. That's the way it goes. But now, to do something extraordinary, beyond that which mechanically can happen, that which you either survive or you don't. To use this individually, you have got to make yourself more complex than just that which is survival-oriented, just that which will keep you alive. And to do it the way that I best like describing it for the time being is you have got to think more than you have to. That's what makes you more complex, and not in ways that you necessarily can begin to predict. And I'm not going to try to any more than if you were following me for the first part of this, when I said that life is complex enough that over here if we identified it as some specific problem, like an economic problem, an emotional problem, and we say that is a problem and it is a serious problem locally, no doubt about it, but life is complex enough, has enough backup systems that will take care of this, and you say, well, I don't see one. And I say, well, it's not one you'd normally think about. All right. If you're, those of you who got that, in the same way, of trying to think more than you have to, there is no systematic prediction. I can't give it to you. If I even hinted there was one, I'd be lying to you. There is not one. It's just you have to think more than you've got to. And to ask me, well, about what? Everything. Yeah, but specifically, everything. Yeah, but what if I start thinking about, I've had this personal problem. Uh, that It's just a personal thing with me, and I, I would like to think more about it. So... Should I think that I shouldn't have it? Or what should I think specifically about this specific problem? Nothing in specific. Well, if I'm going to think more, if there's actually some boon, as you say, to thinking more than you have to, then I should be thinking something specifically about this problem. So, you know, give me a hint and get me started. No. 
the truth is, it doesn't matter. That sounds crude. It doesn't matter. In the same way that I'm saying life is complex enough that it can undergo some small trauma. But locally, it seems to be a large trauma, maybe an all-invasive trauma. But life is complex enough everywhere across the complete spectrum of human life that can be complex enough that areas take up for this, that back it up, that seem to have no three-dimensional connection. That is, the birth rate in some area could be backing up an economic calamity over here. You know, what kind of connection is that? None. All right. In the same way of you being more complex, you never know how you're going to be or use a backup system of you having thought about stuff that you had no need to think about. You didn't have to think about it. And now things come, and it's like somebody last trying to give you body blows here and there and mug you and clip you around the ankles and hit you from the behind and blindside you. And it happens, and you don't really know how if you had to describe it, but you do more than survive. It's now a kind of new survival. You even get better from it. It even becomes a form of pleasure, which... I'm not about to go into tonight. At least any of you want to start some kind of New Age masochist club. <laughs> and that ain't what I'm talking about. A piece of me saying you've got to think more than you have to. Uh, those of you who might recall the mythically severed head of Orpheus, if you remember that story, laid there and continued to sing. Now, so too might I point out that outdated ideas continue to serenade and to influence man's intellect, humanity's intellect. Now, for me to call it outdated is from a more complex view because it's all right at the level at which it's operating. But what you're dealing with is a very limited source of energy, and it is so tied to the time zones that if you're living even right now, you can find yourself. Life does this through men periodically, not over wide areas, but it will have people here and there begin to rail against and struggle against some idea that seems to be prevailing in their area. Religion's a great example, that there are people spotting up forever, going on right now, that are decrying their particular religion, or where religion seems to be the most persuasive in their locality, and they don't really know why. They may even be fairly intellectual about it. They may be able to point out all of the shortcomings historically. They may be able to point out how this particular religion does not live up to its premises and all of that, which is easy enough to do. But in a sense, what they're doing is they are, that individual living in a different time zone to this particular idea, and they are finding it outdated. That's all it is. Not that it's wrong, not that it was ever wrong, not that it's any more wrong than it ever was, not that it's any better than it was, not that his or her personal opinion or critique of it has any validity. They are now living their nervous system in a different time zone. But you all remember that time is a place. They are finding the outdated idea still influential or they would not be critiquing it. They would not find it offensive. <laughs> now, beyond that, but beyond that ordinary level, a real revolutionist has got to ignore. You have got to learn how to and the need to, to ignore this miraculous dead head singing. Because whether they intend it or not, as always, I can try and make my own use out of the myth because that is part of the subtle story whether they had any need to see it that way then is that you're standing there looking at a miraculous occurrence. A severed head still continuing to talk and to sing. So you've got a miracle, uh, something extraordinary. But now coevally what you've got is a dead head a non-growing head, an intelligence that has now been severed. And you're now listening to it. That is, it's a miracle, but simultaneously the miracle is 
Do you follow? I was going to be crude, but on tape they don't want me to say those naughty words. Crap. You, it's a miracle. You have a severed head talking to you, except what it's got to say is crap. <laughs> but, but you see the problem with ordinary intelligence, that you are absolutely amazed. We have here a severed head, and the son of a gun continues to talk. And just on that basis, you already, you're sold at whatever it says, you know, quick, write it down, live by it. And yet what it says, nobody ever expects that any kind of miraculous occurrence is simply going to give out useless information, <laughs> outdated information, because if the head is dead, what other information can it have? It can't know anything about the future. If there was such thing as the present, it can't even talk about the present. It's already dead. It continues to talk, which is a miracle. Hallelujah. And so after that, nobody notices what it says is absolutely useless. It's outdated. A real revolutionist has got to be past being impressed whatsoever. And this is not a subjective struggle of some kind when I say impressed. But you've got to see it for what it is, that the world is being run intellectually, by and large, from a more complex time zone to see it. The world is being fairly well led greatly influenced, serenaded by this miraculous dead head singing. A real revolutionist to carry the, I'll take that down myth and wring its neck. How about this? A real revolutionist not only has got to recognize, to say the least, the shortcomings, <laughs> of a miraculous deadhead singing about old outdated ideas, but a real revolutionist to carry that a little further. What you got to do is like a new, instead of that deadhead singing and you listening to it and being carried along, is you have got to begin to like clap your own <laughs> hands and stomp your own feet and like begin to sing a fresh song, a new song from this fresh, bloody spot this left where the neck was chopped. Not the head, but now you got a fresh spot. Virgin, bloody, ready to go. But you got to ignore that no matter what it's singing. You got to recognize that whatever the life, whatever information is being sung to life that's readily available, it might as well be Orpheus's head. It's a miracle, and some of it sounds interesting and intriguing, but it is a dead head continuing to sing. It's laying there and it's miraculous. But you've got to create your own miraculous. And that is by being able to see that for what it is and start singing from a new place yourself, this fresh place. I'll give you a hard note to post for those of you that like to post notes up on your own brain. Uh, me talking about or using the term of it being outdated, the ideas from the severed head, the ideas that seem to be primarily ruling, influencing the general flow of life is them being outdated from a time zone that is not in any way coeval with revolutionary activities. On the basis of all that, let me say this, that if indeed you found within you an evolutionary dead end in you, remember this, it's in you. Do not go out and repeat this in life. But if any of you people found in some way that there is some sort of dead end in me, just remember this, it is in you. It ain't out there. If that got too <laughs> obtuse, at the ordinary level, that has no validity. Although many people say that they believe that they have some sort of dead end in themselves, they might not use the term evolutionary dead end, but believing that they have uh, suffered subconscious traumas, uh, that they have psychological 
failings that keep them from being able to explore and experience themselves as full human beings, and etc. Forget that. That's the ordinary level. That's the way things are supposed to be. I'm telling any of you people, so many of you drew a blank because you have experience that you just hadn't ever heard it described, much less if I'd predicted I was about to describe it in this way. But all of you have had a taste of this, that you feel as though there is a kind of evolutionary dead end in you in some specific area. I don't mean just in general or you wouldn't still be in here. But that you find that there is some specific something in you that the more you might, let's say, verbally attempt to use some of my own maps and descriptions, you might feel as, oh, well, genetically, somewhere out down my family line, somewhere there seems to be in this one specific area almost an evolutionary dead end in me. That is, there seems to be something in me that I can't overcome. And it's obvious from no moral, from no external position of judgment, it's just I know that this is not revolutionary in me. This is not exploratory. This is not heroic. I got to get over this. I got to get around it. I got to subdue it. I got to do something with it, and I can't seem to do anything with it. That is what I mean, the feeling that there is an evolutionary dead end in you. If there is an evolutionary dead end in you, I'll do it again. Remember this. It is in you. Don't look anywhere else. So if it is in you, do not look anywhere else for what? Oh, help. How about that? <laughs> if it is in you, how are you going to get help somewhere else? <laughs> if you've got a flat tire inside, how's somebody going to fix it? You may find a place that specializes, or say they do, flat tires of all kinds repaired and fixed. No problem. If it's in you, it can't be fixed by anybody else. <clears throat> Next paragraph, a real revolutionist knows that he cannot, that he will not ever conquer the true enemy. <laughs> That is a fact. But now, after a fact, how about a question? Is knowing that you can never conquer the true enemy, is that the same thing? Is knowing, remember the old pagan story of Odin, and the God, that pagan Norse god and all the good people, the heroes that died and were already with him, like him, like that myth, is knowing that you will never conquer the true enemy. Is that the same thing as knowing that the true enemy will finally conquer you? Is it the same thing? That wasn't that tricky. Did my tongue slip? Is knowing that you cannot conquer the enemy, is that the same thing? Just another way of saying that, all right, the enemy is going to conquer you. <laughs> when it comes to any sort of struggle, is it simply a matter of win or lose? Is there no middle ground? <laughs> Under ordinary three-dimensional intellectual conditions, to say the very least, as you should be able to immediately see, there is very, very seldom even the appearance even the perceived illusion of a middle ground. I guess would account for the popularity, the continuing popularity of that great, late and great Latin phrase of tertium quid, 
which almost was on to something. I've been waiting years and years to pull that. Because at one time, somebody almost thought they had something. Of a third relationship to two others that is unexpected. That's more or less the definition. And that's what, in truth, middle ground would be. I know in game theory, economics, and here and there, it'll pop up that somebody says, well, let's don't, let's don't force this particular struggle between competing industries or governments. Or, let's don't push it into just a win or lose situation. Let's try and find some sort of middle ground so we can all work together for the blah, blah, blah. That is not the prime mover of energy even the prime way in which people think. You should know that. It does pop up, but that's why I went ahead and said, seldom in the ordinary course of individual events does a man's intelligence tell him, even remind him, even bring up the possibility there might be a middle ground. That is not the way the individual local reality seems to work. It's all a matter of win or lose. You're either making a profit or you're not. You're either going to sell your car and get a decent price for it or you won't. Somebody's threatening to mug you, you're either going to get away or you won't get away, and they're going to take everything you got, and maybe your life. That life is continually that kind of good, easily felt, definable, perceivable dichotomy. That you're either making a little progress or you're going backwards. You're either happy with what you did today and that you're glad you got up an hour early and ran an extra two miles, or else you're feeling guilty because you ate three pizzas last night and overslept. It's always that matter. It's like it's a matter of win or lose. Seldom is, can there even be a perception of. Does your mind even seem to present, remind you of the possibility there might be a middle ground? And one way to look at a kind of sketch about the dynamic behind this lack of a middle ground is to continue the picturization of a kind of battle if what the ordinary intellect sees and perceives is there are two grounds. There's my ground and there's my enemy's ground. And there is no middle ground. Because if there were a middle ground, what you'd be dealing with would be alien ground. It would be territory that would be outside, outside completely the realm of three-dimensional awareness. Because there can only be in an ordinary battle on this level. A struggle of any kind, philosophically, theoretically, spiritually, intellectually, physically, economically, politically. There's my ground, which is my position, whether it be thought-wise, economic-wise, any-wise. There's my position, then there is my enemy's position. That is, anybody who is not staying here with me, which is about limited to me. Sometimes a sexual partner, a mate, sometimes maybe a family member off and on, during the holidays or <laughs> but by and large your territory your ground is your ground and very seldom is there room for much of an army well that is very seldom is there somebody in life that you trust and it's not something you can describe it's not something you can plan you can't work on it you either meet somebody and you do whether it be the same sex or another sex somebody that you feel as though yes this is my army generally as put I trust this person as much as I do me I mean, they're just almost like me. It's just very rare, very seldom in life. The rest of the feeling is the grounds that are possible are the ground on which I stand, emotionally, intellectually, every other way, physically. It's my ground, and then everything else is my enemy's ground. And there can be no middle ground. Because if the ordinary intellect could perceive of it there being a middle ground, it would indeed be shocking. It would be staggering. It would be out of the realm of the ordinary energy needed for the intellect because it would be perceived as alien territory. It would be ground that does not exist here. It would be a feeling of, I know it sounds strange, but my God, where would that ground come from? <laughs> this ground doesn't belong here. You look around and ground... In other words, there should not be some sort of tertium quid that, hey, there's my ground and my enemy's ground, but wait a minute, I just realized here's some ground that doesn't belong to either one of us. No. At best, again, with 
the unexpected triaxial nature of life, if you want to go this far again right quick of no great consequence, you could get some ordinary intelligence. If I wanted to push it this way, I could say, wait a minute. There's a, the ground, physically and metaphorically, upon which you're standing in this particular situation that you described to me, economically, politically, sexually, social, whatever it is, and that person goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you understand what I'm saying, at least metaphorically, if not physically, materially, there's your enemy's ground, the person trying to get a better business deal, the person trying to run you out of business, your competitor, or somebody attempting to steal your wife away from you, sexually. Yeah, 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 I got that. So that's your enemy's ground. And they say, yeah, and that's it. And I say, well, wait a minute. How about all these people that don't give a damn about your business? People in other business? Or how about people that are not interested in you or your wife? Wouldn't you say that that's kind of neutral ground? Ordinary intelligence might go, well, yeah, but so what? Not necessarily hostily, but just literally, so what? It is not the kind of energy that fuels ordinary intelligence. You can say, well, yeah, you're right. And just like that, it's gone. Not because of some flaw in or an ordinary person's part. It is not the energy needed to fuel ordinary intelligence. But there is a third ground. And if it was seen, and if I say, wait a minute, don't just dismiss it when we're saying that there are areas that I'm calling ground that is not either your ground or your enemy's ground. There is a great potential significance there, enough to just blow your mind away if you're interested in this kind of stuff. And they go, all right, well, tell me more. And I say, well, it's not enough. <laughs> And they'd say, no, you just described areas that are not involved in my struggle here. And I say, okay. All right, we got it that far. But look at it real, real hard and try and think about it. If I could push them in a certain way, all I was trying to get at was they would finally go, oh. And it would begin to strike them that not just the land, but trying to think that way is alien. And it would begin to hurt. It began to frighten them. They began to think, well, I'm having some kind of cyclical dreams. I began to think, well, it's very important. I think it's not important. It's kind of like going back and forth, and it's like I've had too much to drink. And it's like I can't think about that anymore. That doesn't have any real bearing on my problem. You're just trying to play with words. You're trying to confuse my mind. Something else that I'm still laying groundwork for those of you that haven't forgotten that I was going to present you with my decades present with my new creation myth. I don't know when the last real creation myth was ever presented. <laughs> That's easily 2,000 years, isn't it? More or less. Well, at any rate, An almost inevitable aspect of all the other creation myths up until now, one of the inevitables, that say in some way for creation to grow, that people must suffer, and that specifically somebody attempting to do something out of the ordinary that the myths would call a hero. Now, I'd normally want to call you people a real revolutionist or a real explorer. That that sort of life, after staying the ordinary life, is suffering. You all know that. You didn't have to hear a myth or come see me. Everybody knows life is suffering. Check with Buddha. <laughs> Check with Moses. Check with your mother. Go in the bathroom, look in the mirror at yourself, and go, yeah, shoo. <laughs> Not only is life suffering, but then the myths, if they go past creation, which all of them do somewhere, is that life is suffering. Just being created, being born, you're going to suffer because you're going to die, but you're going to suffer in the meanwhile. But then are these archetypical figures, these heroes, that they go off on some kind of quest, some sort of revolutionary adventure, where they, as they leave where they were, where they should be, and go off somewhere else to do something. And it entails what? And don't say a good time. 
living it up. <laughs> New suffering, additional suffering. Oft times, death. Untoward death, early death, crucifixion, destruction. Not just a normal death, but they're out there in the prime of their life, out on some great quest, and they die. <laughs> they get eaten alive, and then the dragon spits them back up and eats them up again, and then spits them back up and calls over some of his neighbors, and they stomp on him until he just <laughs> turns into mush, and then they eat him again, and then spit him back out, that kind of thing. It's the myths are to make sure that you understand <laughs> that this hero, that is somebody trying to do something extraordinary, they didn't die just a little bit. I mean, it just wasn't a regular dying. They died and then got brought back and then died some more and they died them again. They killed them, they extincted them, they brought them back to life and they chewed on them, they spit them out. It's supposed to give you the impression of extremely distasteful suffering, not just ordinary suffering. <laughs> there is a little bit of good news for those of you that can see it. That had some kind of validity, or it wouldn't be that kind of continuing story. Now, of course, you've got to realize I gave you a little hint from certain views, certain quite real views, those stories, the latest one is about 2,000 years out of date. <laughs> not that it's not serving some purpose. It's serving very good purposes here and there. In large local areas, all those myths, whether we call religions or revelations or whatever, they're still myths, but some of them, are still serving great purposes, but from one very valid view. Uh, the one I was just having in mind in general is at least 2,000 years outdated. The little good news I was going to point out to you is that if you know how nowadays, assuming that had some validity even at the, what would seem to be the obvious <laughs> level, if it did have some validity, one way you could look at good news is that nowadays you can make a kind of revolutionary journey as possible and the only suffering that you really undergo is a kind of pleasurable discomfort <laughs> as suffered by your own old severed Orpheus head <laughs> Still singing along. <laughs> and you ignoring it and beginning to sing your own new, more complex song native to alien territory. <laughs> so from that kind of view, everything about you that's normal, decent, middle class, already established, can be said to suffer. But if there was any actual material validity to the old idea that to do something extraordinary, you had to actually go out and you had to do the kind of suffering that seems to be in, emblematic in the lives of a Buddha or a Jesus or a Moses or whole groups of people. If indeed, I'm just saying, if indeed that at one time had some real material validity that you had to do it, the good news, if you look at it this way, unless some of you actually want to start a New Age masochist club, which don't bother to send me an application, <laughs> you can look at the good news being that you no longer have to do that if you ever did, because now the suffering can be limited to the kind of internal discomfort that is the pleasure of poor old Orpheus, that is your poor old outdated intelligence singing every reasonable, conclusive, first story song and it's lost its audience. <laughs> so that's why I use not to be just flippantly oxymoronical, but I use the term the suffering is a kind of pleasurable discomfort. <laughs> but it's all internal. It's all private. And it's all just your own nervous system internally, not externally. You don't have to worry about wearing hair shirts and having yourself strapped up on a cross or nailed up there or set on fire. I mean, not unless you want to, that's up to you. <laughs> the heroic struggle, that kind of additional suffering <laughs> incumbent upon a hero, a would-be revolutionist or explorer, nowadays is possible to be done without actually ruffling up your hair much or messing up your clothes. 
much less bleeding on yourself. <laughs> and yet in spite of that, I'll wrap it up with this since I don't have time to go any further with it, so I'll just use it as a wrap. In regard to suffering and etc. As I'm going to tell you, by way of great suggestion, that a real revolutionist cannot be comforted. <laughs> oh, well. And if he could, he wouldn't allow it. <laughs> 